Good morning, everybody. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all you mamas out there. A special blessing upon you today. My mama and my dad live in Arizona, Prescott, Arizona. So they don't watch very often, but just in case they are, happy Mother's Day to my mom, Barbara Brandstetter, in case you didn't know my maiden name, <laughs> uh, in, in Arizona today. And to all of the moms and grandmas and daughters, uh, we just... We honor you today, and to those of you that have lost mamas or babies this year, we, we love you, and um, I just pray that today's service will be a blessing, and that you will feel and sense and experience the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in this service today. Would you close your eyes with me as I lead us in a word of prayer? Lord, we're grateful for the opportunity to be in your house on this day, May 8th, 2022, Mother's Day. We honor our moms today. Lord, we'll, we're so thankful for the gift of motherhood. We pray that you'll bless all of the moms today and that you'll bless this service and that you'll anoint all of the special things that are going on today. And we invite your presence here. We know that you are here where two or three are gathered in your name. You're here with us. We love you, Lord, and we thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us?
Just a reminder that there is communion available at any time during worship. You're welcome to serve yourself to communion, you and your family today. You're the only answer to the darkness. You are only right among the wrong. You're the only hope among the chaos. You are the voice that calls me on Louder than every lie My sword in every fight The truth will chase away the night Your name is power over darkness Freedom for the captives Mercy for the broken and the hopeless Your name is faithful Mighty won't let us down or fail us Your name is power Your name is power No it is written hope is certain No the word will never fail faithful to each and every one of us. He faithfully pursued you until you were saved. And if you're not saved this morning, he's pursuing you. His heart is for you. He loves you. He's seeking you this morning. So be open to his word. Be open to his spirit this morning, no matter where you are in your walk. If you are far from him, if you are near for him, be open. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are thankful to be your children. We are thankful to be gathered in your house today. We are thankful to be with brothers and sisters 
in Christ, our spiritual family that will be with us for all of eternity, Father. We are thankful that you've given us this gift. We're thankful that you've given us this community, this gathering that is breathing life into us, your spirit that is alive and empowered in each and every one of us is being poured into the lives that we touch, God. Let us be aware of that. Let us pursue that in our lives, Father. This morning, open our hearts and open our minds as we hear your word, as we proclaim your word through song, Father. Let us let you, we want you to know, Father, that we love you. And these expressions are an act of love to you, God. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. If you would all stand, I know you just sat down, but now I'd like for you to stand again because I'd like for you to go about the room, uh, find somebody that you do know, don't know, whichever, shake their hand, hug them if they're comfortable with it, Uh, don't kiss them, we won't, don't do that, but greet someone this morning. Make our way back to our seats. We're going to continue this morning in our worship. As I always say, our giving is an act of worship. It's our response, our love response for God, the love that he has for us. We respond in the love that we have for him. And as I like to say quite often is that God's not after our money. He's not in pursuit of our money, he's in pursuit of our heart. And he realizes that where our money is, our heart is. That's always uh, indicative of of where our heart is in our lives, is where we are putting our money into on a regular basis. And so by us showing, demonstrating to him that this is where our heart is, it is in the kingdom of heaven. It is furthering the kingdom and it is an acknowledgement that all of the provision we have in life is from him. The gift, the skill, the resource, all that we have has been given to us by our Father. So as the gentlemen come to take up this offering this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we we love you. We are thankful that we get this opportunity to worship you through our giving. We are thankful for all that you have done for us in our lives. 
You are the great provider. And we acknowledge, we realize, Father, that everything that we have has been a gift from you. You've freely given it to us. And so this morning, we respond back to that love through giving back to your kingdom. We pray that you would bless it, further your kingdom through it. In your name we pray. Amen. There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation. Jesus. There is a light that overwhelms the darkness. There is a kingdom that forever reigns. And there is freedom from the chains that bind us. He is Jesus. Jesus. Sing this with me. Who walks on the waters? Who speaks to the sea? Who stands in the fire beside me? He roars like a lion. He bled as a lamb. He carries my healing in his hands. Jesus. There
master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. But there's something about that name. Yes, there's something about that If you're not already seated, you may be seated at this time. I believe we're going to have a special Mother's Day presentation. Yeah, if we could bring the lights up for just one moment. Yeah. We've got a special gift this morning. Uh, for all of our mothers who are here. And actually, before we do that, there's something that's been on my heart this week as we've been preparing for Mother's Day is we have all kinds of different mothers. We have biological mothers. We have adoptive mothers. We have foster mothers. We have grandmothers. We have spiritual mothers. You may be mothering people that you don't realize but you're doing so spiritually and God has gifted you with that season. We also have mothers who are hopeful, who long for motherhood, who desire motherhood. We have mothers who are filled with joy. We have mothers who are filled with, with sadness, who are grieving. We have mothers across the spectrum who are dealing with different things, going through different things. But here's the truth in your experience may be positive or negative as it relates to motherhood. Maybe you had a positive experience as a child. Maybe you haven't been a perfect mother. I want you to know this, that if you are redeemed in Christ, you are accepted as his child. And your identity is that you are a daughter of the King. That is your first and foremost identity. No matter how you feel about being a mother, no matter what your understanding or perspective of it is, you are a child of the King and you are accepted. He is pleased with you and he forgives you if you've not been perfect. He is gracious and he is merciful. He loves you as his child this morning. Accept that identity. I don't know who you are. Everyone just bow your heads for just a moment. If you're a mother here this morning and you struggle with that, not being a perfect mother or not being a mother yet or grieving as a mother, accept this in this moment. I am a daughter of the King. And God loves me. He is pleased with me. He accepts me for exactly who I am. No matter if motherhood never comes for me, no matter what it turns out like for me, he loves me and accepts me as his own child. God, thank you. Thank you for giving us mothers. 
Thank you for giving us an identity as your child and that you accept us simply as that. And there's nothing left for us to achieve, God, except for just being received as your child. Thank you for loving us in that way. Thank you for giving us a gift of life and accepting us, Lord. We receive that acceptance this morning as a daughter or as a son of the King. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. We love you. Amen. Amen. Now, now we'll kind of move on with our next um, moment of this morning. I'm going to pass it on to my mom, who knows the talking parts here, not me. Now, you guys know after listening to that, that's not true. <laughs> He's always, when he was a little boy, he didn't talk very much. People ask if he ever talked, and I said, well, no, not really, but I think he's making up for it, don't you guys? <laughs> uh, one of you ladies want to come help me from the front row here. What we're going to do is ask all the mothers to come forward, please. No, you can't come, Todd. If you're a mother, please come forward and stand it down here, and you want to give them a, a, each a rose, and probably they need to be wiped off at the bottom because I had them in water, and uh, I don't want to get you guys all soaked um, we're going to give you a, a long stem red rose and a, a free 16, a gift certificate for a free 16 ounce drink of your choice at Hot Shots. So this is your Mother's Day gift from us. Um, one of you ladies want to pass out these for me? Um, come on, you go, ladies, just come, keep coming. If you've, if you're a mother, if you've had a child and you've lost that child in any way. Maybe you had um, a miscarriage. Maybe you've had a, a loss in another way, which, you know, it, at the time was not a choice, a good choice, but you know that God loves you and forgives you and that little baby's in heaven. If you want to come forward, please, we want to acknowledge you this morning. Please stay up here. Becky, come back here. She just slipped right back there. Didn't you see that? <laughs> Please come forward and let us acknowledge you this morning. Uh, we've got some towels if they're, are they, if they're dripping or anything right here. Okay, right here, some more ladies. Marky, are you going to help too? You want to hold, hold to the stem? <laughs> hold to the stem. <laughs> My little, if you didn't see that, that was so cute. Mark took the bulb and just jerked it up out of that vase. My little grandson said the other day a little girl came over to look at their goats. She wanted to buy one, and she picked a flower, picked one of uh, Amber's flowers, and she just plucked it up out of the, and he was so upset. He says, that, that baby picked mama flower. <laughs> he did not like that at all. So yeah, I'm telling on you, Alex. <laughs> He's going, Mimi. All right. Did everybody get one? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Did we miss anybody? Okay. All right. Um, I just wanted to say how much I love every one of you and appreciate you. Something that has been acknowledged in my life. In the, in my, nobody knows I'm going to say this because I didn't know I was going to say this till this morning. Uh, and I felt prompted of the Holy Spirit. And that's, uh, I have nine living grandchildren. And I have two in heaven. And I don't talk about those two in heaven very much. And, um, but the Lord just kind of chastised me. And he said, do you have 11 children, 11 grandchildren? And so I just wanted to say this morning that I have 11 grandchildren. Yes. And I want to acknowledge them this morning. And if you've got babies in, in, in heaven that you don't think about very often, acknowledge them this morning. And your daughters or whoever it is that you love that lost that baby, uh, let them let them grieve with you because that's the way I feel this morning that I'm grieving with one of my daughters and I have three so I won't tell you which one it is that's up to her but um, we love our babies we love our grandbabies and we're all great moms aren't we in Christ we're great moms my son is going to pray a, a blessing over you this morning as mothers and then you can go back to sit down at your seats <laughs> Let's bow our heads for just a moment.
Father, how thankful we are. How thankful we are that you created great women of God. All of the future mothers who are in here today, if you have called them to become future mothers, God, we also include them in this prayer because they are your children and they may serve as spiritual mothers, they may serve as biological mothers, they may serve as adoptive mothers, they may serve as foster mothers, God. Thank you for giving them the grace and the gift and the mercy that they show and they demonstrate through their mothering. I pray that you would continue to give them the grace, God. I would pray that you would continue to give them the capacity to continue to mother, to mother children outside of their own biological framework, God, but become spiritual mothers. This morning, stir up that within mothers this morning. Stir up that gift and that grace that you've given some. That we would begin to, that moms would begin to love and to nurture some young children and some young, young men and young women and become mothers to them who are without, who don't have a good uh, concept or uh, a good uh, background or understanding or perspective of what it means to be a mother. God, I pray that you would give them that grace and you would give them that opportunity this morning. Give them the strength. We are thankful you've made them so strong to be able to shoulder all of the burdens, all of the cares that it requires to mother, to steward lives, to raise children. Thank you for giving us mothers. We need more mothers in the kingdom of God. We thank, we're thankful that you've given us faithful mothers who are raising their children to love God. They're demonstrating the love of Christ within their family structures. We're so thankful for mothers. We pray that you would bless them, have your hand upon them, that they may continue faithfully and obediently. In your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 As you're being seated this morning, I'm going to ask the girls who sing with me up here to come on up. We're going to sing a special song before Pastor brings the word today. I was thinking about that this morning as I was driving in, and at our house, we have a favorite TV show that we know every episode, and we know a whole lot of the lines by memory. We own the DVDs, and when we traveled in our old 2004 Yukon that had the drop-down DVD player, and our kids were young, we played those DVDs on the road for every trip, and it was The Andy Griffith Show. And I know there are lots of you out there who love that show, too. My kids can quote so many of Barney Fife's lines, and they, they do it really well. What I love about that show and maybe about that era is the sense of community. Remember how they would sit on the porch and play the guitar and sing and talk? And I think, what, you know, what has happened to us? Technology came along. Computers came along. They were supposed to buy us more time and do our jobs for us so that we could have more time. And instead, I feel like they just have eaten all of our time. And churches were the cornerstone of community, and life has gotten so hectic and so busy that through the course of time, churches aren't that. They aren't what the, I think God intended for them to be anymore. And even if we offer opportunities for community, people are so busy they don't often come. So it's really, really hard. But this song that we're going to do today, and then COVID happened, right, Pastor? And churches, the sense of community at churches was lost entirely for a while. Um, this song says, we are sisters in the Lord. This is for all of us women today. And I just want to say to you that if I have neglected to be the sister to you that you need, I apologize for that today because life is hard and life is busy. And it is my desire to have community with each one of you, particularly you ladies. Charlene, I love you. You and I have often said we should have coffee together. And have we ever done it? No. But ladies, I love you. We are sisters in the Lord. So um, we girls worked this song up this morning. Scooch in a little closer, girls. Help me out, okay? I've never walked a mile in your shoes, tasted the tears you cried. I've never known the deepest longings you hold inside. I've had my share of disenchantments, 
days when I've been so low. But I'm here to say, no matter the heartache, you're not alone. We're going to start again. Please forgive me. Online people, please forgive me. I was supposed to change the key. So hold on just a second. I can already tell the girls were going to be like, oh, no, that's too high, Sherry. So my bad. I apologize for that. Here we go. Let's try that again. All right, Sam, here we go. This is better. I've never walked a mile in your shoes, tasted the tears you cried. I've never known the deepest longings you hold inside. I've had my share of disenchantments, days when I've been so low. And I'm here to say, no matter the heartache, you're not alone. I will be there with you through all the joy and sorrow. I will be there to point to one who holds each tomorrow. And we are sisters, sisters in the Lord, our faith in common, sisters in the Lord, no matter how the world defines us. Nothing can break the tie that binds us. We are sisters in the Lord. We were all little girls at one time, full of hopes and dreams. And now as we give ourselves, we're learning what love really means. sorrows I will be there to point you to the one who holds each tomorrow we are sisters sisters in the Lord our faith in common sisters in the Lord no matter how Nothing can break the tie that binds us. We are sisters in the Lord. Take my hand and I'll take yours. We'll reach together. Ladies, beautiful song, beautiful song. All the boys and girls who are 4 through 11, it's time for you to go upstairs right about now, and Miss Shelley Mullins is going to be teaching and leading our youngins this morning. So you guys, this way, right up the stairs, okay? All right. Thank you to Miss Shelley. She gave me one directive. She said, Pastor, have all the mothers pick the kids up today, not the dads or anyone. So if your kids are here with you or your grandmother or something, feel free to do that. But um, I think maybe she has something for the moms when you pick the kids up this morning. All right. This morning is Mother's Day. Welcome. We love each and every one of our moms, and we do welcome you to the service today. Um, I was 
I was doing some quick computing, and because it's my uh, 65th trip around the sun, I have attended about 65 Mother's Day services in my life. That's a lot of Mother's Days. And uh, my dad and mom were pastors all my life. Growing up, I was raised in a pastor's home. Yes, that explains a lot about me. I know, I know. I am uh, the, the, uh, I'm the preacher's kid that your mom warned you about. <laughs> Um, but I love the church, I love God's people, and I love Mother's Day. What a special day. It's actually more special than uh, Father's Day in a lot of regards. Sorry, fellas, but um, on Mother's Day, there's like a hundred and, and, let's see, 139 million uh, phone calls placed or something like that. And Father's Day, it's only like maybe uh, half of that. Uh, for fathers, telling you that most of us would rather get in touch with our moms <laughs> on those special days than our dads. Now, one, one father was not real excited about that. He raised his little boy in school and paid for all of his, his, uh, all of his gymnastics and all of his soccer games. And when he got a little bit older, he bought him football gear and made sure he played in every year. And he was in every, he was in every game. He was in every sport the kid wanted to play. The kid got better and better and went on up through school and and finally he got to where he was playing college football. And uh, after all the years and, and expense and time that this father invested in the, in the boy, uh, the TV cameras were on one, one, one game, his first game, and ESPN zoomed in the camera on the boy, and he looks at the camera, and he says, Hi, Mom. <laughs> Hi, Mom. And don't you know, guys, that's the way it is. It's all about the mothers. It's all about the mothers. Well, I want to talk this morning about good and bad mothers of the Bible. But let's begin, first of all, with good and bad moms uh, in, 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 in our lives. For instance, uh, you may think that your mom was the worst or that you're, you know, you're a bad mom or something. Let me just direct your attention to Ma Barker. Has anyone ever heard of Ma Barker? She lived in the 30s. Am I, am I, some of us are dating ourselves here, right? but I, I heard about Ma Barker. Um, was she in California, Brother Charles? Do you remember where she lived, I don't know, maybe the mid Midwest, not sure, but Ma Barker, uh, in the 1930s, she was seen as one of the highest uh, criminals in America. J. J. Edgar Hoover, who was the FBI uh, uh, leader at the time, director said, the most vicious and dangerous and resourceful criminal brain of the last decade. That's what he said about Ma Barker. And she turned crime into a family business. Her sons, Herman, Lloyd, Fred, and Arthur, all jumped right into the family business, murder, kidnapping, carjacking, robbery, all they learned from, from their mom, <laughs> from their mom. So how's that for bad parenting? So moms, are you feeling better yet about your parenting? Feeling, feeling a bit better? Okay. How about this one? 1935, uh, she, she had one of her, her sons, uh, one of her, she and one of her sons were killed in a shootout with the FBI. So when you think about a bad mom, or you think maybe you had a bad mom, think about Ma Barker. Let me give you another example. Uh, this lady's name was Mary Ann Cotton. You may not have heard of her. She was, she was uh, an English lady in the 19th century. She was a nurse and a housekeeper in England, but she had a secret hobby. She poisoned and killed 11 of her 13 children. Yeah, you heard that right. She poisoned and killed all four of her husbands, two lovers, plus two other people, all for their insurance money. Arsenic was the murder weapon of choice. She uh, raked up a, uh, she racked up a body count of 21 people before Scotland Yard finally captured her and they hanged her on March 24 of 1873. So moms, when you think you're a bad mom, just think about these two ladies. You'll realize you are a great mom. But I echo Michael's sentiments, you are great mothers. We've got some great moms here this morning, fantastic mothers. You're a great mom. The Bible says in Psalm 31 that her children respect and bless her, this, this, this godly mother, godly woman. Her husband joins in with words of praise. And many women have done wonderful things, but you have outclassed them all. Outclassed them all. And may I just say we got some classy moms in this church here this morning. Amen. I got an amen from my wife. Anybody else? Amen. 
So when you think you're doing a bad job, just understand you're doing an incredible job. When you feel discouraged, think about the Octo Mom. You better remember Octo Mom? She had eight babies. That's correct, eight at the same time. Well, she had a little help. I think the doctors had to help her with that because she had those eight babies. But she's the Octo Mom. She took some uh, uh, fertility drugs and sure enough, eight months. So next time you get a little discouraged with your parenting skills, think about the Octo Mom. Or, um, or if you think you're failing in your marriage, think about that young lady, Casey Anthony. Oh my gosh. Ugh. Okay, enough of that. You're a great mom. You're better than you think you are. Uh, but there are also not just bad moms in history. There are some bad moms in the Bible. Can I just mention a couple of them? The first one, her name is Athelia. And uh, following the death of her husband in, first, in 2 Kings chapter 11, her husband and her son, uh, who reigned as king over Judah, um, after they died, she massacred all but one of her own family so that she could be the ruler over Judah. Talk about a bad mom in the Bible. You know, we read about these wonderful moms, these super moms. We, we read usually typically in a Mother's Day service. I'll hear uh, referenced Sarah, the mother uh, of, of, uh, you know, of Isaac. And I'll hear reference to all the wonderful mothers throughout the Bible. Uh, even the mothers who had these, these supernatural births, you know, these supernatural conceptions. There are at least seven of them that I found in the Bible that uh, they weren't supposed to be pregnant. They, there was no way for them to get pregnant, either they were barren or her husband was, or they were past childbearing age, or in the case of Mary, the mother, the mother of Christ, she was a virgin. That had never happened before, nor has it happened since. I know there are a lot of, hallelujah. And so, <laughs> and so even, even Mary's, even Mary's conception, we know was supernatural. We know it was the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we know that Jesus was born of a virgin. So what an incredible mother example Mary has been for us as a woman of faith. But, you know, it's easy to get caught up in all those and think that we're not doing so well. So I thought it'd be good maybe to focus on some bad moms of the Bible. For instance, there's another one. Um, her name is, uh, uh, well, let's see, her name is Herodias. She was uh, Herod Antipas's wife. She was responsible for the death of John the Baptist. Do you remember the story? It's found in Mark chapter 14. Uh, he told her and her husband that they were living in sin. And he was right. He was a prophet of God. And he just basically called them out for their sin. He said, listen, you're, 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 uh, you're, you're living in sin. This is not right. God says to stop it. You're not married and so forth. And uh, so that made her a little mad. She got a little angry. So she told her daughter. She said, um, I, I want you to dance and I want you to get Herod to kill John. In other words, she taught her daughter, imagine if you will, from the time the, the girl was a little bitty ballerina. And so she taught her to dance and had all these wonderful moves and stuff. And then she taught her these sensual dances moves that men would be interested in. And she, she made these costumes for her with her own hands. And uh, then came the time when she danced for Herod and it was so alluring and so enticing that Herod said, I'll give you anything that you request, anything you want, you name it. So she goes back to her mom, and she says, Mom, what should I ask for? And mom said, that, that John the Baptist, he called me out in my sin, asked for his head. So she said, off with his head, and that's exactly what happened. They brought her the head of John the Baptist on a platter because of this mother's wishes. What a mom, what a bad mom. And then there's Lot's daughters. I didn't even, you know, I didn't even think I'd mention those, but here they are in my notes. So in Genesis 19, we don't know their names, but they're the daughters of Lot, and they became mothers because they got their daddy drunk. Remember the story? They had got him drunk and then had sexual relations with him as he was lying in a drunken stupor. They conceived and bore children, and they were moms. What a bad mom. What a terrible mom. And then, of course, there's Eve, the mother of every living person. Imagine being remembered as the person who severed our relationship with God because of your sinfulness, because of your disobedience, not the greatest decision. But her character and her, and her husband's character, Adam, he's not innocent in this, they transferred to the children and two of her sons were part of the very first homicide in human history. Imagine, if you will, she was the first mother to ever bury a child. 
Eve. You see, ladies and gentlemen, our decisions affect generations. Did you hear what I said? I said our decisions affect generations that follow after us. What I do today, what I think of today will affect my decisions and my decisions will affect my, my actions and my actions will affect those following me, those looking to me, those that I'm teaching, mentoring, and in my sphere of influence. So my decisions affect, my, affect other generations. Ladies, you're not a bad mom. I believe we've got a church filled with incredible, gifted, anointed women who were standing here a moment ago as Michael was praying the prayer of faith over them. And I tell you, he had a real prophetic word, and so did Glenda, uh, before that prayer time, or during that whole prayer time. And, and I pray that you'll receive that as a mother today, and that you'll be encouraged. Uh, I'm not here this morning to beat you up and tell you what a bad job you've been doing and what a lousy mother and try to compare you with some other mothers in life or history or in the Bible. I want to say you're a great mom. And everybody that believes we've got great moms here with us, put your hands together. Let's give a round of applause for our mothers. Amen? Amen. Ladies, you're not a bad mom. There's some great moms in the Bible. I mentioned Sarah, the mother of Isaac. She waited 25 years to have a baby. And you know, she gives hope to every lady who's still waiting <laughs> to have that child. Whew. Next time you feel a little impatient, read her story again. God spoke to her and it took 25 years for that promise to come to pass. That's a long time. In life. Then there's Hannah, who was the mother of Samuel. It's an incredible woman of prayer. She prayed for a son, and when, when she had this baby boy Samuel, she kept her promise to the Lord. She brought him to the priest, and she released him to do ministry. Hannah, a woman of faith, a woman of prayer. So Sarah is a mother of faith and, and, and patience. Hannah obviously is a mother of prayer and prayerfulness. And then that brings us to Mary, the, the little gal I mentioned a moment ago, the mother of Jesus, pregnant as just a teenager. You know, uh, that's a big problem in that time. She could have been stoned in the center of the village, but she and Joseph chose to protect this little child. Aren't you glad she, she went on with the process and brought the, birth, the, the Christ child into the world? You know, Oriental culture in this day said that a woman caught in her particular a uh, condition was to be stoned. Well, listen, they didn't just throw rocks at you and you run and hide behind a tree like we used to when we were kids. They would take a woman and they would bury her in a pit up to her neck. She could not move, she could not escape. And then everyone would, I say everyone, the men would all stand around the edges of the pit with stones as large as, large as they could throw. And they would cast those stones down and hit that woman in the head and she would, suffer that until she, until she died. Um, I, I, interestingly enough, I recently, I don't know, it's been a couple of years ago. Now I researched a little bit. It's easy for you to research. Just Google one of these days, not now, but one of these days, where is stoning legal in the world? You'll find there's over 20 nations of the world today where stoning is a legal form of uh, death or, or so, well, I guess it's always death in, in, in the nations of the world. Here's how it's done in most countries. Women are buried up to their neck, but men, interestingly, interestingly, are only buried up to their waist. Huh. So man, I guess, could wriggle and get free. I don't know. I, I don't understand that. But I know that Mary's condition, she found herself in pregnant as an unwed teenager by, cult, by custom should have called for her to be stoned in the center of the village as an example to the rest of the village. And the rest of Girls, women, men, boys, everybody. This is what happens to those who are caught in, in the act of adultery. You remember when, when, when this happened in front of Jesus in the New Testament? You remember the story? Uh, there was a, a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. We don't even know her name. We certainly don't know the man's name. We don't even know what happened to him. We just know that a group of men were dragging her. Where were they going? They were going to the stoning pit. They were going to stone her until she died. And Jesus, you know, they passed by him and one of the religious guys says, hey, here's a good opportunity for us to, to entrap this spiritual leader. And they said, this woman's been caught in the act of adultery. What do you say that we should do to her? The law says we should stone her. What do you say? I'm telling you what, Jesus always answers with grace. Can you say amen? 
He fulfilled the law in his own life, in his own lifestyle, and he did so for you and I, and he always answers with grace, and that's exactly what he did. He said, listen, to whoever's among you without sin, you can cast the first stone. I want to see who you are, Mr. Sinless One. And of course, there was no, there was no answer. The next sound you heard was the thud of the stones falling from their hands. It got really, really quiet as they turned and left. And then he turns to the little lady, the girl caught in this act. And he said to her, where are your accusers? And she said, sir, I have no accusers. He said to her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. He didn't condone her actions. He didn't say, well, what you've been doing is fine. He just says, I don't condemn you. But I want you to go, and I want you to, here's what I want you to do. Stop sinning, okay? Go and sin no more. In other words, your actions have been sin. I want you to go, and I want you to stop your sinning, and I'm going to extend to you grace. If you're glad Jesus offers to us grace in this day and hour, say amen. <laughs> amen. Whew, my, my, my. Mm-mm-mm. And then there's Naomi. I, I miss Naomi. What an incredible story. She was she was the mother-in-law of a woman named Ruth. Ruth later married a guy named Boaz, and I've always known that if Boaz had never met her, he would have been ruthless. It's okay, it's all right. It's all right, you feel free to use that with someone. <laughs> but Ruth was, uh, Ruth was a, a, an incredible woman, and so was her mother-in-law, Naomi. She was such a woman that, that Ruth chose to stay with her after the death of her husband before she met Boaz. And there was something about Naomi that caused Ruth to love her and care for her, her mother-in-law, to support her like she was her own mother. Isn't that beautiful? I love to see that support go beyond um, the lines of marriage and so forth. I love it when uh, in-laws love one another and they're not outlaws. Isn't it it great when, when families get together like that? And so Naomi was an incredible example for us, as was Mary, as was Hannah, as was Sarah, and the Bible just goes on. You know, Mary Mary had a pretty good resume when you you considered her resume item, uh, uh, gave birth to the Savior of the world. That's a pretty good item to put on your resume. Mary did. What an incredible young lady she was. I love to talk about her story. So women highly valued in the Bible, highly needed in the world, highly respected by this church family today. The Bible teaches that a Proverbs 31 woman, a godly woman, in verse 37, carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. In other words, she's not lazy. She's keeping an eye on what's happening in the household. I like to insert that. I think that's important. And mothers are an incredible influence in the world today. I told you about the... the, the, the uh, the, the Mother's Day cards that were sold, 139 million uh, of them were purchased for mothers and, and about half of that for, for fathers and told you the joke about the high mom looking in the camera and so forth. But it is true that a mother, a mother represents influence. So I want to encourage you today, moms, because I believe that uh, these thoughts uh, that I'm about to connect with everyone, not just mothers, but everyone will minister to you. Here's the thought I want you to grab. Number one, You are where God wants you to be. You are where God wants you to be. Can you put that up on the screen? There may be some folks that would like to copy that down or take a picture of that because I believe it's powerfully uh, important for us to understand. Often we think, oh, if only I had married so-and-so. If only I had gone to this state. If only this had happened in my life. And, And we spend our lives looking Somewhere, you know, I've got a couple of pictures somewhere I took um, a few years back. One of them was a, a longhorn uh, cow. Our neighbors up the road used to have longhorns, and I caught one of those longhorns sticking his head through the fence one day. It was a, it was a uh, pipe fence, and he stuck his head through. Those big old longhorns were like this, and he was eating that grass on the other side. And then on the other side, I kid you not, on the other side of the street were some horses, and one of the horses one day, I caught that horse. Guess what she was doing? Her head was over. She was eating grass on the other side. And I took pictures of both those because it's amazing to me 
how that the grass is always greener somewhere else, right? But I want to just say to you, God has you right where he wants you for this season of time. We sometimes wrestle with, am I doing what I was made to do? And as a mom, I think, I think that's a constant struggle. But you know, men struggle and women struggle. Listen, it, 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 doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. We all struggle to make sure that we're finding our sweet spot. We're being exactly where God designed us to be. There's a woman by the name of Esther. You want to talk about being where God wanted her to be? Oh, my goodness. This little gal was just maybe like, I don't know, 16, 18 years old. Just a little a teenage girl. She was a virgin. She was a Jewish girl. And she was a looker. <laughs> In fact, she was so pretty that the, the, the king of the foreign land where the Jews had been uh, taken captive and being held in, in, in captivity, the king sent his guys out and they were looking for beautiful women to fill up his harem so he could have all these beautiful women. And they were searching and looking and they came across Esther. And they, they found this little gal and they thought, man, I'm telling you, she's just, you know, she's like a peasant village girl, but with a little polish, this girl could be sharp. And so they, they chose her, and they took her to the king's palace, and they, they put all the expensive oils on her, and they did all the you know, spa treatments, and she got on the right diet and exercise. I don't know what all they did with her, but she was prepared to be a, a, a queen for the king. And then there came this time, and the story's a little bit longer than what I'm telling you now, but there came a time when she was given an opportunity to spare the Jewish people. There was a man by the name of Haman. And in Jewish culture, every time Haman is mentioned, what do we do, Todd? Boo. boo. We boo and hiss. <laughs> Todd's got a little Jew in him, if you can't tell. That's why he knew he was in the right occupation, selling those cars. Is that right, my friend? Well, in the Jewish culture, when you mention Haman... Oh, you get booze and hisses. Nobody likes Haman, especially the Jews, because he was the guy who was going to kill them all. And so, so Mordecai, I'm giving you a lot of names. I know you have to research the story on your own, but Mordecai, he's like a cousin to Esther. And Esther's in the palace, and Mordecai gets word of this, this plot to kill all the Jews. And so he goes to her and says, listen, we've only got this short window of time. This guy, this Haman... He's, thank you very much. He's going, to, he's going to have all the Jews killed. He's got, he's, going to, he's got a decree. He's going to go to the king. It's going to happen. Our people are going to perish. She said, well, what can I do? And he said, basically, you've got to go to the king. Well, listen, you don't just walk into the king's uh, court. You don't just go in unannounced and without a, an appointment and so forth. You could have your head whacked off, like off with his head, like that. And she knew that, but in spite of that, she said, listen, you call everybody to fasting and prayer. We're going to touch God for the next three days. Then I'm going to go and talk to the king. And if he, if he kills me, he kills me. But I'm going to go in on behalf of our people. And, and, and the Bible says she did this uh, for such a time as this. Mordecai, these are the words of Mordecai. He said, listen, could it be that God has you in the kingdom for such a time as this? Could it be? Oh, I love that thought. I love the thought that you and I are where God wants us to be for such a time as this. Moms, you're raising those little guys and sometimes it gets to be burdensome and sometimes it gets to be crazy around the house. I know, I know, I know. I, we've raised four. We've got all those grandkids Glenda was talking about. It. And I, you know, my mom raised us. Dear Lord, I can't imagine all that. And I know it's sometimes crazy. But it's so important, so vital. Those little guys you're raising up, those arrows in the hands of a mighty man, you're not going to have them forever. They're not going to be in your household or under your influence forever. They're going to get out on their own. They're going to live their own lives, marry their own spouses and raise their own children. And will they be living for Christ? Will they make it to heaven? Will they make an impact for the kingdom of God? It's up to you and I. You and I have influence today, and mothers have tremendous influence, not only in the family, but in the church and in the community, moms, you are influential and God's put you right where you need to be for now. So she was placed exactly where God wanted her to be. You and I are in the same position. Okay, so let's take a look at our second thought this morning. Number two, don't believe <laughs> all of the stuff around you, the social media and all that you're hearing and all that you're seeing and all that you're looking at because guess what? No one's perfect. Oh, I used to be perfect. 
And then I started getting older. I lost my perfection somewhere along the way. And uh, none of us are perfect. Would you agree with that? So don't believe everything you see online. For instance, when you look online, guess what? You are seeing the highlights of someone else's life. You're seeing the highlight reel. You're not seeing the behind the scenes stuff that's going on. In fact, I love to, to look at all these staged photos. My favorite one, and if you've done this online, I love you, and I'm not being critical. Oh, yes, I am. But I love this one. I, I love this one. It's where, it's where a guy gets down on one knee, and he proposes to the girl, and the girl is accepting his proposal in this photo. Okay, that's, that's, that's wonderful. We're getting married. We're on a beach or somewhere. That's great. But don't do this like you're, you're, like you're totally surprised by what he's doing. Because we know that it took some setup for that photo. Huh? I mean, you hired the photographer or you ask your friend to come over, take this picture of us, we're going to do these wedding photos, we're going to do these engagement photos or whatever, and we're going to pretend, come on, come on, about half of, no, not half, about three-fourths of what you see online has been staged very well, most of it. Let's see. Okay, I'm going to put this cup of coffee here. Oh, it's not steaming. I need to get it hot and steaming. There we go. Put a latte art on top of it. There we go. Open my Bible here. Oh, let's open it to Jeremiah 11, 29. I know, the, I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord. Or better yet, um, Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ. And so I'm going to open it up to my favorite passage. There it is. And let's see what else. Um, what else says me? What else? What else um, oh, here's my, my iPad, my phone. My, oh, my, my, my AirPods. I'm going to have to put those in the picture. And, and, here, and I'm posting the picture as just me having a casual day in my devotion time, hearing from the Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Am I being silly? Well, okay, good. I want you to get the point. Sometimes we get kind of silly. Don't believe everything you see online or everything that people say about themselves. I'm so glad I've got a, a wife who doesn't get on, on social media and brag. <laughs> and dear Lord, am I glad she doesn't post pictures of me. Lord Jesus. <laughs> Man, because most of the pictures you don't want to see. <laughs> you don't want You don't even want to see those pictures. <laughs> All right. So let's, in other words, let's just don't depend on other people for our sense of value and our purpose. Glenda doesn't care how many likes she gets. She cares that her, her children know how loved they are. That's the kind of mom Glenda is. And um, really what Glenda learned a long time ago was that the best place to be famous is in your own home with your own kids, your husband. Can someone say amen to that? That's the place to be the most famous, most important, most vital with your kids, with your children. <laughs> it grieves my spirit. It grieves my spirit when I see families in public and little children are, are um, obviously wanting mom's attention for something or some, something. And mom is so busy with her head down and her phone. She's absolutely oblivious to the needs of those children. Sometimes I want to go walk up to her and take the phone and just say, excuse me, ma'am, take the phone and go throw it in the toilet or something. I mean, come on, you've got, you've got a responsibility here. And I know if that takes place in public, how much worse is it when you're at home by yourself? So moms, I, I know I'm not here to pound you. And I know <laughs> Sister Sherry brought it up a minute ago. She said we used to have times of community and fellowship and the front porch used to be bigger than the back porch is now, you know, back when we were kids or whatever. And, but she said technology, which was supposed to give us more time, has taken our time away. And it's certainly taken our attention away. So can I just encourage you to focus on less technology, more face-to-face -face time with your children, your grandchildren, and your family. Would that be all right? Will y'all let me do that and not throw rocks at me? Good. Okay, finally, my final point this morning. Be the biggest influence you can. I've really already kind of, kind of hammered this a little bit, but Paul, when he was writing to Timothy in his second letter, Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, he says, remember, I said, I remember your genuine faith, Timothy. 
you share the faith that, you, that first filled, this, listen to this, your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice. See, there's, a third, there's three generations of faithfulness. And I know that the same faith continues strong in you. It's interesting, he didn't mention Timothy's dad or grandfather. I don't know where they were in the picture. But he did mention the mother and the grandmother. And on this Mother's Day, Timothy was one of the greatest leaders in the church. He was a protege of the Apostle Paul, learned at his feet and so forth. And um, he was just an incredible young man and writer of the New Testament, two of the New Testament books and, and so forth. And um, he learned from his mom and from his grandmother. They're the ones who influenced him in the faith. They're the ones that brought him to the place where he was. So be a Christ-like influence in your children's lives. Build a legacy into your kids' lives that will impact generations after you. In 1985, Dave Thomas, the founder of Wendy's, wrote in his book, Well Done, he wrote, and I quote, when I was 11 years old, my adoptive grandmother took me to Michigan's Gull Lake to be baptized by immersion. I really felt that I was accepted by God when I was baptized, but what I remember most about my baptism was that my grandma Minnie made it happen. For her, Christianity meant more than doctrine you talked about on Sundays. It meant teaching her grandson about faith. From an adoptive grandmother, Dave Tommy, excuse me, Dave Thomas uh, changed a lot of lives through Wendy's. He continues to through the Wendy's foundations and the Wendy's camps. Look those up sometime and see what an influence this little orphan boy had on, on, uh, on America and on Christianity because of a grandmother, an adoptive grandmother that cared about him. So don't settle for the cool mom. Strive to be the Christ-like mom. Be an example at home and at church. Your influence matters. Stand with me, please, would you, everyone? Because of the little story I just found this week, I thought it was cute that you might get a kick out of it. One day, little Jimmy got home early from school. His mom said, why are you home so early? He said, well, I was the only person who answered the question in my class. Wow. She thought, my son must be a genius. What was the question? Jimmy said, the question was, who threw the trash can at the principal's head? <laughs> oh, come on. That was funny. I deserved a courtesy laugh, right? Oh, my goodness. Thank you, moms. Thanks for serving and loving. Thanks for raising these Peckerwoods, <laughs> putting up with them. I've got a wonderful mother in heaven. I'll see her one of these days. And... Um, I'm going to thank her again when I, when I see her. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> she wasn't perfect. Boy, she had a, a, a Scottish temper. <laughs> Man, it would light up every once in a while. She'd light you up. <laughs> but she loved me and she loved my dad. She loved my brother and my sister. Loved my grandkids, her grandkids, my kids. And I'll see her again. I will. Father, we just bless every mother here this morning as we bow our heads, everybody. Would you just help them to make a choice to be the, the, the biggest Christ-like influencer that they can be? Not to look to social media to see what we, who we can influence. That's, that's okay. It has its place, but what's more important is influence in the home, influence in the marriage, influence in the church. Work this in us, I pray. Stir our hearts. Draw us, Lord, closer, ever closer to you as moms, as dads, brothers and sisters, and strengthen the community, I pray, within this body. It's been spoken to you already this morning. I just pray, Lord, you would give us love for one another that outshines it all. I mean, the people would look at us and say, my, how they love one another. Let that be our testimony, as was the early church. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Before you go this morning, I'd like you to take a moment and go across the aisle.